My last video covered the false equivalency fallacy that shows up so much in all these woke arguments. People always saying, what about this and what about that? Get ready. We're going to get another round of that as soon as the Matthew Doloff and Lee Keltner trial gets underway. And if you don't remember, Matthew Doloff uh, shot Lee Keltner at a Denver protest, and Matthew Doloff is claiming self-defense. Hmm, there's going to be some similarities between this case and the Kyle Rittenhouse case that's going to get everybody wound up. I think it's important that we understand the similarities and differences between that case and the Rittenhouse saga. Hello out there. I am trying to get through. With his powerful brain waves cradled in the warmth of reasoning, it's time for Johnny Walker Dread to straighten you out on a thing or two. Emanating all the way from exciting Las Vegas, Oklahoma, it's the Johnny Walker Dread Show. All right, let's start off by reading a news article that just came out just a few days ago. It says, former security guard pleads not guilty to a murder in Denver protest shooting. Now, again, this is going to be really important for the Kyle Rittenhouse case. If Matthew Doloff is convicted here, you can imagine what they're going to be wanting of Kyle Rittenhouse. A former security guard who shot and killed a man at a rally in Denver in October pleaded not guilty to murder Friday. Denver prosecutors charged Matthew Doloff with second-degree murder for shooting and killing 49-year-old Lee Keltner on October 10th. Doloff was working as a security guard for nine news reporters at a Patriot rally in Civic Center Park when he and Keltner got into a dispute. Keltner discharged pepper spray at Doloff, who shot Keltner. Doug Richards, Doloff's attorney, has previously argued that the 31-year-old acted in self-defense when he opened fire. The judge on Friday did not set a date for trial and said he would set one after the next hearing, scheduled for August 2nd. All right, is there enough evidence here to at least consider this as a self-defense trial? In other words, is there enough evidence for there to be the question of self-defense? Yes, that, of that there is no doubt. And so the prosecution is going to have to prove that Doloff did not act in self-defense. Out, recording that other argument that Lee Keltner was involved in from a different angle. Don't touch me, old man! Don't touch me, old man! Don't cry! Don't touch me, man! Don't touch me, man! Don't touch me, man! Don't touch me, man! Okay, here's what I find to be rather interesting. Uh, the guy in the foreground there who's yelling at the old man, we have an interview of him that I'll show you here. I'm not going to play the entire interview, but I will show you where it's available and you can listen to him talk about what happened. Um, his beef is with Lee Keltner, the man on the, well, he's out of the picture now, but the, the really big dude that's on the far left that was arguing with him, the old man steps in between him and you'll notice that Jeremiah, by the way, that's the man's name, turns his attention on the old man and starts arguing with him. I don't think that this guy here in the foreground wants to tangle with Lee Keltner. I think Lee is a pretty good sized dude and I have a feeling that Jeremiah figured the old man's a little bit of an easier target. Okay, so now we have Matthew Doloff who is standing right to the left of the person with the camera. The one that was taking the video right now is the Nine News reporter that Doloff is supposed to be guarding. So you can see right there, that's the leg of Matthew Doloff, and he's getting into an altercation with Lee Keltner. That's how fast it happened. Nine seconds. The producer's clip did not capture the shooting. Watch his video again here, just before Lee Keltner walks away from that first dispute. Don't touch me, old man! Don't touch me, old man! Don't touch me, man! Don't touch me, man! Now, Lee Keltner could have walked away from this, and he could have as well, Jeremiah. There was no need for them to get involved any more than that. They've been yelling at each other. The old man has got in between them, kind of separated them. There was no need for any further altercation. Now the question becomes, what happened between Lee Keltner and Matthew Doloff? Well, it looks like Lee Keltner might not have liked being videotaped. Yeah, 
Okay, so he doesn't like the camera, and he steps in, and then he gets in an altercation with Dolov, who's the security guard. What happens next is captured by Denver Post photographer Helen Richardson. Keltner takes a swing at the security guard. In another rapid-fire image of hers, Keltner backs away and sprays pepper spray toward the security guard. That's when Matthew Doloff draws his weapon and pulls the trigger once, killing Keltner. So let's take a look at this again. This is going to be an important photograph that's going to be used in the trial. Now, keep in mind, as I've said before many times, a photograph doesn't necessarily tell the story. It looks here pretty bad for Matthew Doloff. There's a pretty good separation between the two. One is armed with pepper spray. You know, is that a lethal weapon? Uh, okay, we, we could talk about that. Uh, the other one is armed with a pistol, but it looks like Matthew Dolohov has plenty of opportunity to avoid the confrontation. But again, this is just a still photograph of an actual event, and things happen really quickly. They were closer together just a moment before. So although this photograph looks bad for Matthew Dolohov, I don't think it tells the whole story draws his weapon and pulls the trigger once, killing Keltner. It's also when Brian Loma started running up. We've shown you his video for several days now. You can see Helen Richardson from the Denver Post there in that orange vest that says press. 12 seconds later, as uniformed police close in with rifles drawn, the Nine News journalist starts recording again on his iPhone. He keeps saying, I'm press, I'm press, I'm press. This is the person that Doloff is guarding. Doesn't matter. You've had somebody shot. They're going to put everybody on the ground. Who's going to get me? That guy was going to get me. Well, what do you mean Mike was going to get you? Uh, what was he going to do? I mean, that, that's going to be the ultimate question. And again, it's about what Matthew Doloff thinks. What did he believe Lee Keltner was going to do to either him or to the Nine News reporter? It's his second and last clip before police confiscated the phone from him. He maced him. He maced him, so that's when he shot him. Okay, so he's acknowledging right here in real time. Now we'll hear from one of the attorneys. For the first time since this happened on Saturday, we are now hearing from an attorney representing the family of that security guard, Matthew Doloff. We spoke with Doug Richards on the phone within the last half hour or so. And on behalf of Doloff's family, here's what Richards told us. He said that Matt was acting in self-defense. Matt put his life and now his liberty in between the now deceased and the Nine News employee. This was not a political assignment for Matt, Doug Richards said. This was simply Matt protecting your employee. Well, now the question is, did he face a deadly threat or a threat of serious bodily injury? When asked what the city might do to Matthew Doloff for working as a security guard without a license, here's what Mayor Michael Hancock said. And so while this is still an investigation, we do plan uh, to, to pursue fully the scope of uh, our legal power within the situation, but we'll allow the investigation to go forward. But within the last couple of hours, the city attorney's office went further, emailing us this statement saying, quote, regarding Matthew Doloff, there could be civil or criminal actions taken or both against Mr. Doloff, Pinkerton, Nine News, and or any other entity that hired and deployed Doloff in an unlicensed security guard capacity. Now, I really love the exasperation that he uses in his voice inflection, or both. I mean, I can't believe it. They're going to be taking civil and criminal actions against him. Well, okay, they might. This is what I've been telling everybody, that you can't just assume that just because somebody breaks the law that they are not entitled to self-defense. Here, Matthew Doloff may have broken the law when he took on a security guard job that for which he was not qualified. Okay, it has nothing to do with his self-defense claim. All he has to be able to say is, hey, I feared for my life, 
or the Nine News reporter's life was in danger. And by danger, we mean serious bodily injury or death. That's what matters. It doesn't matter whether he used a gun or whether the gun was registered or whether he was working in a legal capacity. Okay? I don't want to hear it. It doesn't matter. Now, this is where the hypocrisy of the left is going to show up in this trial. Because they're going to come in and say, it doesn't matter whether he was a licensed security guard or not. He can defend himself, can't he? He can defend the life of that Nine News reporter, can't he? What difference does it make? And then they'll turn around and say, Kyle Rittenhouse can't employ self-defense because he was carrying a weapon illegally. I am not hypocritical here. I'm telling you, whether Doloff was legal in his capacity of working as a security agent or whether Rittenhouse was legal in carrying the weapon is irrelevant. We'll see how it plays out, but I know the left, and I know how they're going to spin this. Okay, so this is the dude that was in the altercation, the one that was wearing the Black Guns Matter t-shirt, all right? And he's going to weigh in here. I don't know what the, what, what the initial reason why he chose to stop and talk to me was. And you said at one point he suggested that he might uh, uh, escalate it. Yeah, I mean, he made threats of violence against me, um, you know, and then he exacted physical violence against you know, one of your reporters and your security, you know, luckily was there and stepped in. Did uh, Denver News is on. Okay, so just to be clear, that security dude didn't step in to save you, all right? He would have been perfectly happy watching you get pummeled. The security guard came into play because Keltner turned his attention to the Nine News reporter and went after him. So don't make it sound as if the security guard saved your life. Furthermore, I think it's a little bit disingenuous for you to be claiming totally the victim here. It looked to me like you were jawing off just as much as the other dude. In fact, it looked like you were just as aggressive. Is out there. Yeah. Did, um, did you see a firearm on Lee Keltner? Um. I didn't see a firearm on Lee Keltner, no, but I, it was my belief that he had a firearm from the threats he made and his posturing. And okay, so let's go ahead now. Let's talk to Robert Barnes. The Denver shooting. Denver shooting. This is an this is an interesting one uh, in terms of secondary legal questions. Everybody knows the, the bottom line overview of the case is is an unlicensed security guard working to protect uh, nine news at a protest, a uh, Trump supporter, or I, I think the person was a Trump supporter, uh, had bear mace on them for whatever the reason, an altercation ensues, and what happens when you have an armed person with an armed person, different arms, and one arm prevails, the unlicensed security guard pulls the gun, shoots the guy, uh, end of story. Now, so the, the question is, He's been charged with second degree murder. So I mean, for anybody who doesn't know, I mean, just explain the difference as to what goes into the difference between a first degree and a second degree murder charge. I don't know why he wasn't charged with first degree homicide, because unlike the Rittenhouse case, there did not appear to me a self-defense under Colorado law. So Colorado's self-defense law is more limited than Wisconsin's is. Um, so Colorado's self-defense law requires that you have proportionate response and it be the only uh, remedy. So whereas Wisconsin doesn't have to have that. With Wisconsin law, if you fear imminent harm, you can use grave bodily harm to the other side. I'm not sure where he's getting this. I read the uh, Colorado statutes and I'm not seeing it. Um, we'll take a look at those in a moment. You can't in Colorado. So this guy has someone, uh, he slaps at him, then he backs away, then he uses bear mace, and he just pulls out his gun and in cold blood goes, boom. Uh, that is not a self-defense under Colorado law. So I don't understand why he wasn't charged with first degree homicide. It is kind of odd that he's being charged with second degree. I mean, if you really do think that this was not self-defense and you're only going to charge a guy with murder if it's not self-defense, why the second degree charge? It doesn't make any sense. You would go with first degree, I would think. Keep in mind, Kyle Rittenhouse is being charged with reckless homicide. In other words, the death resulted from 
reckless handling of his firearm. Uh, the other one with Anthony Huber is a first degree intentional homicide, not second degree. A second degree murder charge here just seems rather odd. Um, so I don't think he has a self-defense available to him. It's interesting to watch the left somehow claim Rittenhouse did not act in self-defense, but this guy did. I understand the political nature of that. I mean, we sort of see it on the right in the Breonna Taylor case, in my view, people's unwillingness to be skeptical of what the police did uh, in the Breonna Taylor case because they're so accustomed to BLM lies about what police conduct is. I'll go ahead and back him up on this one, okay? With Breonna Taylor, I went in and I did a video where I am very skeptical of the police's claims about her death. I think that Black Lives Matter may have a point on that, okay? In terms of the Dolov case, I'm on the fence on this one. I'm not sure that this is self-defense or not. It's kind of iffy, you know. Uh, with Kyle Rittenhouse, I absolutely fully believe it's self-defense. So you can be consistent. You don't have to pick the side that your politics tells you. You can go against it. And in the case of Doloff, I'm going against it. Even though the person that was shot was a patriot, conservative, or whatever, which would, I guess, align to my political beliefs a little bit more often than not, doesn't matter. If it's self-defense, it's self-defense. And if the evidence comes out to show that it was self-defense, I'm on Doloff's side on that one. Right now, I'm on the fence. I'm not quite sure. And with Breonna Taylor, I think that the police are in some trouble there. I'm not buying the police's line that everything is kosher there. Should they be charged with murder? Should it be murder? Well, I guess you could make an argument for reckless homicide, you know, that their invasion of the apartment and the way they handled the situation was reckless and therefore her death resulted of it. I could see that. Uh, it depends, again, on what the evidence says that we should mention. I believe that there is enough evidence to try the police officers on reckless homicide. I am not convinced they're guilty. Why? I don't have all the evidence in front of me. I would like to see the evidence before I make a conclusion. However, I am skeptical of their claim. Um, and, and they had some choice comments for me last week, but I responded to most of them. Most of them were in good faith. A few were not so much, but that's okay. Uh, the Oh, by the way, you're on mute, Viva. Is I'm oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Is is the distinction between first and second degree not premeditation, or whether or not there's a, a a defensible excuse for the conduct? In most states, the difference between first and second amendment will be intentional versus reckless. So it usually second amendment is where you cause someone's death but didn't intend it. But I don't know how you put it that way when a guy pulls a gun and shoots right at his chest. That that's about as much intentional as you could get. You could see, like in a Breonna Taylor case, a reckless homicide charge where you're not even intending to hit her uh, if you believe that she, they were reckless in their self. They lack self-defense because they were reckless. That's how. Okay, so I got a little confused there. I apologize because Wisconsin's a little bit different. Second degree intentional homicide is a homicide that arises out of sort of a hot flash moment, right? Uh, you catch your wife in bed with somebody, you get mad, right? And you just open fire. In other words, not premeditated, spur the moment due to emotions. First degree is intentional. You planned it. You had plenty of opportunity to not carry it out, and you chose to carry it out anyway. Reckless homicide is a different charge. And so what he is describing is that first degree is sort of the intentional homicide, and second degree is the reckless homicide. So it's different than Wisconsin. Okay, so we're now going to listen to a lawyer here that's going to talk about self-defense. This is a Colorado lawyer. He's no, he knows the law better than I think Barnes does. Getting pepper sprayed is not serious bodily injury. You're not allowed to kill someone because they pepper spray you. Doloff was arrested on Saturday and is charged with murder. Ultimately, the only real question is, was he in reasonable fear of imminent serious bodily injury or death? And as I've said, what I've seen so far, pepper spray certainly does not put you in fear of serious bodily injury. According to the Denver Department of Excise and Licensing, Doloff was not licensed to be a security guard and never has been. According to Denver City documents, a license and endorsement are both required for plainclothes security guards. Okay, so again, I don't care about the whole licensing thing. It has no bearing on this case. Well, it could for another charge, but not for the self-defense murder deal. Now, again, this trial is going to come out. 
And all of the wokesters, the BLMers and all that, they're not going to be able to distinguish between this case and Kyle Rittenhouse. Keep in mind, they're going to claim, well, this Lee Keltner, he, 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 he had a bear spray. That's like a weapon. And, and, and like Rosenbaum didn't have anything. He, you know, this is so unfair. So you see how Kyle Rittenhouse should be convicted and Dolop should not be. I mean, this is so unfair. Again, they're not going to be able to understand that Joseph Rosenbaum was trying to take Kyle's gun from him. Whether you think that that is worthy of self-defense is one thing, but to say that that's the same thing or lesser than bear spray is disingenuous. The two cases are different. They don't have the same elements. And therefore, you can't say that, that just because Doloff was found guilty, that Kyle should be found guilty as well. That just doesn't make any sense. But again, that's what they're going to be trying. This is that false equivalency. Uh, go back and watch my video on the false equivalency argument if you're curious as to what that's all about. In case you're wondering what serious bodily injury is under Colorado law, it says here, serious bodily injury means bodily injury, which either at the time of the actual injury or at a later time, involves substantial risk of death, eh, probably not with bear spray. Could you die from it? Yes, but substantial risk means that bear spray would have to be fatal fairly commonly, and it does, and it is, it's rare. A substantial risk of serious permanent disfigurement. No, that's not going to be applied here. A substantial risk of protracted loss or impairment of the function of any part or organ of the body or breaks, fractures, or burns. Okay, what about the eyes? Okay, well, all right, I could see an argument made that bear spray can cause permanent eye loss, and therefore a person spraying it in your eyes could warrant lethal force. I don't think it's a very strong argument, and I think that one attorney will tell you that typically the courts don't look upon bear spray as a lethal weapon that would allow you to use deadly force against, but okay. Now, the other issue is, is that did Doloff suspect that Keltner might shoot him with a gun that he didn't see? That's also a little bit iffy. I'm not sure. I mean, they're going to probably try to use that argument. And again, I'd have to see what the evidence is first before I could decide on my own whether I choose to believe that or not. Again, and I must emphasize this so much. And BLM, the woke, are not going to understand this. But I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. The Matthew Doloff, Lee Keltner incident is not like the Kyle Rittenhouse, Joseph Rosenbaum incident. They're completely different in many respects. You cannot just simply claim that if Doloff is convicted, then Kyle should be convicted. The situations are vastly different. First of all, I do think that Kyle Rittenhouse has a much, much stronger self-defense claim than Doloff. I'm not saying Doloff doesn't have one. I'm just saying Rittenhouse's claim is much stronger uh, for a good reason. And that is that Richard McGinnis is on record as saying that Joseph Rosenbaum tried to take Kyle's gun from him. The threat imposed by somebody who takes your gun from you is much deeper and much more credible than having somebody spray you with pepper spray or slapping you with an open hand. Furthermore, Kyle Rittenhouse ran from Rosenbaum. So whatever provocation there was, Rittenhouse tried to get away from Rosenbaum, and therefore he is on much stronger ground than Doloff. It looked to me like Doloff could have easily escaped from Keltner, that there was no real reason to actually have to use a gun. Now, Keltner is going to come back and say, hey, I was defending a third party. And therefore, it's not quite that simple. And that's a good argument to make. Will Doloff ultimately succeed? I tend to think this is kind of like a 50-50 deal. I'm not quite sure that Doloff is going to get off or not. And of course, again, the question now becomes, what role will the mob play? Will they influence the jury to shift the verdict one way or the other? Hard to say. I don't think that this trial has caught the attention of BLM as much as the Rittenhouse one has. However, because of the similarities, it's going to. So be prepared for the false equivalency. 
Like my video, subscribe to my channel.